So this is uh, something um, that I've made using the canther technique. It's a scarf. And, uh, this technique originated in Southeast Asia, Bengal region, and it's a form of recycling essentially. So uh, using saris that were no longer useful to be worn as a, a garment or an item of clothing, uh, but still had some life in them, were torn up into pieces, into patchwork style pieces, uh, and layered, there was this traditionally several layers uh, that were stitched through with this running stitch and the techniques known as uh, kentha. Uh, we are going to share a link at the end uh, uh, that, that explains the history behind this. So if you did want to research it further, that will be there. So I'm going to be, just be using three layers today. So this, as I, I'll just stretch it out and it's quite big to see under the camera but you can see there's lots and lots of different types of fabrics that I've used in here. Fabrics that you can find around the home. Um, for the purpose of today I'm going to do a much smaller project just so that you can see the technique but you can scale up or scale down your project. So if you're wanting to make a bag or a big garment or like a waistcoat or you wanted to make a, 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 a card that you, you can scale it down so you can go either way. I'll put that on one side but I will bring it back in later. So I'm just going to show you some of the materials, very few materials today. Um, so I've got some sewing threads here, I've got a bright sewing thread and I'll, I'll tell you why we've got a bright sewing thread as we go along. Some embroidery thread or floss, you can use your sewing thread for the canther stitches but you, you don't see them as well um, as you would if you was using embroidery thread. I've got some fabric scissors here, just little snips. Um, a, a glue stick. Now, if you're a beginner, and this project is absolutely suitable for total beginners, if you're beginning to stitch in, you might want to use a little bit of a glue stick. I will admit, I do use this actually, I do find it useful, but you can use pins as well. You'll also need your sewing kit, so some needles, ideally embroidery needles, but it doesn't matter if you haven't got them. And then something to protect your fingers. So I've been doing quite a lot of canther stitching. I made that uh, scarf over the past week and the end of my fingers got a little bit sore so you might want to put a thimble on. I don't actually like these hard ones so I've got a synthetic one here and that sits on my finger and moulds around and it's not as in the way as these harder ones so I think these are actually used for people who play the guitar because my husband pinches them sometimes um, but now the end of my finger's gone really hard because I've been using the needle for quite a few days and I don't need it as much. I'll just put some of these on one side. I'm just going to show you some of the fabrics here. So I've got um, all of these were things I've uh, found or salvaged from around the home. So here I've got a piece of bed sheeting. So the bed, my sheet on my bed got really thin in the middle. So instead of throwing it away, I actually tore, I've torn it up and used it for a variety of projects. So that's a piece of bed sheeting. This is also bed sheeting. I did a workshop, I think it was about three or four years ago now, um, Shibori, and we used indigo to dye um, a cloth. So this was a, again on a bit of bed sheeting and came out with these beautiful patterns. So I'm going to use that in the project today. And then here I've got some contrasting ones for the patchwork pieces that we'll have on the top of the canther. Um, and again, I've used a little bit of that Shibori. There's a shirt here, tiny piece actually. Um, I've got a piece of my dress fabric there, then at the bottom another very fancy bed sheet that I've used for lots of different projects. So if you look around your home you'll find these things, shirts, blouses, pillowcases. So I'm going to do uh, a small project today simply because uh, I want you to be able to see it under the camera. I'm just going to get a little bit of card here because the, the background's pale and I want you to be able to see what I'm going to do next. So I've got this piece of fabric here and this is going to be the middle piece of my canther but this is the actual project size more or less. So if you wanted to make a, um, a coaster um, for your cup then it would be 11 by 11. If you wanted to make a placemat I recommend something at around 45 to 30 centimetres. A cushion cover 35 times 35, 
the scarf that I've just shown you was 125 centimetres by 20 centimetres. But the, the, the actual size and the shape of the project can be whatever you want it to be. I'm just going to put my camera straight a little bit because it's a little bit bent. There we go. So I've cut this to uh, tw uh, 20 by 30 by 20 centimetres. So that's going to be the middle base that all my patches are going to go on. But also with another piece of fabric here, so I'm just going to pop that on there and then put this piece on top. This is going to be my back in the blue bit. And you'll see here there's about a half a centimetre margin all the way round. So this piece here, the white piece is 30 times 20 centimetres and then the outer piece is 31 times 21 and the reason for that is is that I'm going to edge it so I'm going to roll that over and make a border all the way around and I'm going to show you how to do that and just pop that on one side for a moment. So once you've got decided on what, what, what size your project's going to be and you've cut your piece of fabric and you've cut your backing fabric, the next thing you need to do is start laying your patches out. So again, with all those pieces that you've foraged for around your home, you can start laying those out onto your middle section. Now this is the bit I really enjoy doing. Now I've chosen here shades of blue and green and red, so three different shades, but you could have, for example, all of them could be shades of green or shades of blue, the pieces could be bigger, they could be smaller, it's really down to your own personal taste. The beauty about this is that um, you can make it be whatever you want it to be there's no fixed rules so you could go for really wacky colors if you wanted to you don't even need to do square shapes i've i've chosen like geometric shapes i tend to go for that for some reason i don't know why um, but you could go for circular more organic shapes if you wanted to And then what you can do also, can you see how that, I don't quite like how that's sitting on there. So you can sort of lift that up, tuck things under, just move them around a little bit if you're not happy. Perhaps put that on top like that. So this is where you do a little, you're playing almost, actually using the pieces to play and see what works and what appeals to you. Okay, so I'm quite happy with what I've got there. And the next thing I could do is pin them into place. So if you're really confident with stitching and sewing and it's something you've done for years, then use some pins to pin everything in place. If you're not so confident, this is where you can use a glue stick. This comes in really handy. So what I'm going to do is just put a bit of glue behind each of those pieces. Now I've decided where they're going to go. And it just helps to hold them. Sometimes people find it a little bit tricky um, when they're pinned in place. So if they're not used to sewing, you end up pricking yourself and it gets a little bit stressful. So this is absolutely ideal. Or if you're using doing something like this with young people as well, or children, you might want to just put a little dab of glue oops, behind each piece of fabric just to hold it in position. And just to take away that headache and stress of everything just falling apart. I'm just turning this over because you'll see here 
there's just a little bit of an overhang so I'm going around and trimming that now just so it's flush up with that original piece of fabric and it makes it less bulky as well when we're doing the edging now I have to say there's no right or wrong way of doing this this is the way the way I'm showing you is the way I prefer to do it but I am not an expert I'm just one of those sort of people who really enjoy uh, stitching and um, finding out how to do things my way uh, but you might go online and find other people do it a different way doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong it, you have to find a technique that works for you and this works for me so I hope that this technique will work for you too so I've just trimmed that up to the edge but what you will see is as I lift it up can you see yeah it's it's not totally secure it's not totally in position so what I'm going to do next is some tacking but first of all I'm going to bring back in that backing piece so I'm going to pop that backing piece down and I'm going to lay all my patches on top and just make sure we've got that half a centimetre border all the way around And what I'm going to do is just, just put a few pins in each corner. And I'm going to start what's known as tacking. And this is just to help keep those pieces in position for when we come to do the embroidery part of the stitching. So I'm using here a really brightly coloured thread. So you remember at the beginning I showed you this thread here. Don't worry if you haven't got brightly coloured thread. It's not absolutely essential, but it does help you. I'm just going to make a big knot at the end. So I'm wrapping that round my finger, rolling it off and then pulling. And then I'm going to start at this edge here. And I'm just going to do some massive stitches all the way across making sure that I take in each of the patches as I go along. And then when I get to the top, I'm just going to go across and then down again. So I'm doing another line of stitches all the way down. So can you see where those two overlap? So I'm going to put that stitch over there so it holds that in position. Bring it out in the next piece and then I'm going to skip over into that piece there. And what that's doing, it's firmly holding all those pieces together. You don't have to do this if you're a good sewer and you're really competent and you're really confident, sorry, with just pinning it in place and that's absolutely fine. You can do that as well. So you would keep going up and down with your running stitches until that's fully stitched together. And the reason for that is that if I turn that over, you can see that's gone through all the layers now. And the reason for that is that when you come to do your canthus stitches, I find that I get into this state of what's known as flow. And if you've got pieces falling off all the time or the pins are pricking you, it can actually disturb your flow a little bit. So I really do think it's worth taking the time to invest in doing these um, tacking stitches just to, to make sure everything's, it's a helping hand. It's just there to help you along. So I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to edge it before I do my canther stitches. You could start canther stitching onto this now before you put your edging round, but I'm going to actually edge it first because that's just how I like to do it. It's my preferred method. The other thing I find beneficial about doing this is that it helps guide your stitches and keep your work nice and neat. Okay, so what we've got here is a one centimetre border around the edge of our work and then what I'm going to do is roll that over half a centimetre and half a centimetre again okay now what you could do here I find this really beneficial is 
iron it into position. So just get an iron, go along that edge, and then roll it over again, another half a centimetre. It just helps to keep it neat when you do it this way. I'm doing this by eye, but you could get a ruler if you want to be really, really precise and measure it as you go along. That's entirely up to you. But again, I quite like doing things by eye because I like it when it's sometimes a little bit slightly wibbly. I don't know why. There's just something quite special. I think it, oh, it gives it that look of being handmade as well. And there's something beautiful about that, particularly if you're making it as a gift. When you get to the end here, so that's, see that's rolled over. So I'm going to go half a centimetre over again and just tuck that end in. And then I'm going to roll it again. And then can you see how that corner meets? You can actually do what's called a mitered corner. I'll show you that on my scarf. Uh, but for a beginner, that can be a little bit tricky. So I'm just doing a, a square corner here. So again, just using the iron as my best friend to hold it down the edging there. And then I would get a few pins just to hold that in place. There we go. So that's the start of the border. What I'm going to do now is show you how to stitch that into position using invisible stitches. You could, if you're not confident about doing invisible stitches, do a running stitch all the way along there in keeping with the canther style or you could do some visible stitches that go round and round called a whip stitch. I'm going to show you how to do some stitches that are hidden. So using a cotton that's very similar to the colour that I'm using, I'm going to start at this end here. Now I hope when I bring this up, can you see this clearly? I'm going to put my needle Oops, dropping it because I'm trying to be slow. <laughs> I was putting it on that fold there and I'm pulling it so that that knot is hidden inside. And I'm going to pick up a little cloth from the bottom here. And then I'm going to get the needle so it's, can you see how that's folded over and it meets there just underneath going to pick up some of the cloth and pull it and then I'm going to pick some of the bottom cloth up that's slightly underneath that edging but care, being careful not to go all the way through all three layers and pull. The same again and just slightly underneath And then onto the patchwork work, another stitch there. And as I pull it, can you see, you can't see those stitches at all, they're hidden. So again, just slightly underneath, making a stitch. And again, picking a little bit from my next layer and back to the edging. Can take that pin out now because it's getting in my way. So can you see here that's actually been stitched and you can't even see those stitches. However, if you're a beginner, please don't be afraid to just do some big stitches along there or some big stitches around and around it. You don't have to have them hidden away. Okay, when you get to the end here, and you'd stitch all the way to the end and then roll, roll that over. And again, pin that into place and just start by doing a few stitches at the end and then going along again with your hidden stitches. When that's completed all the way round, it should look something like this. 
So what we've got here is our piece that's got the border all stitched into position and you'll notice I've also started some canvas stitches just to get us going. What you'll also notice, there's a can you see there's a faint white line here? And what I've done, so we've got the border here that helps as a guide. So that's why I like to put the border on first and then I start my first row of stitches about half a centimetre in. But also I've put some faint lines in here to help guide me. And to do that, what I did was I folded my piece in half before I did the canvas stitching. Now I've got a little chalky type pen here, um, but you could use um, just ordinary blackboard chalk if you have some, um, or you could use masking tape as well. So what I did was I put my little chalk pen in there, made a little marker on that side, did the same on that side there, folded it in half, made a little line in there, then got a ruler and drew a line all the way across to get a white central point there. And then also at the quarter points, you can roll that up the bottom up to that line that you've made there and do exactly the same again. Two little nicks, open it and then rule your white line. You could go even further and do the lines in between if you really, really needed some guidance. Yeah, the other thing you could do is actually put a piece of masking tape across so you've got your central, central line and then you can pull that off after you've done your stitches. That just helps as a guide if you haven't got this kind of chalk pen at home. So the next thing we're going to do is start stitching. We've finally got to the bit where we're doing the embroidery. So I've got here some embroidery thread. An embroidery thread or floss is made of six strands and I'm going to use three of these strands. So I'm just measuring out a length here. Now ordinarily I would probably measure out two lengths but I'm just going to do one length today just to make it a little bit easier under the camera. Now there's many ways that you can split your embroidery thread. I'm going to show you the way that I do it. So if I just move this closer to the camera, you'll see the six strands. And I'm going to tease out three of them. And then what I do is, can you see how I'm holding that? So I've got my hand holding the top end and then I've got my finger in between. I'm just going to very slowly run it down in between. And as I'm doing that, I'm actually forcing the energy down the strand of the thread. So I'm just going to let that go. So the energy unwinds a little bit, otherwise you'll get in a knot. So I'm going to get to there, I'm going to let it go. And I'm just keep going. You have to be very gentle and slow when you're doing this. And eventually it will split in two. So the needle, I recommend you use an embroidery needle because an embroidery needle's got a very long, thin eye. Uh, if you're very good and your eyesight's good, you might be able to use an ordinary sewing needle. This is, can you see how long this one is? It's a bit longer than an embroidery needle. Sometimes they're called cruel needles, but this one's a, a specifically made for what's known as sashiko knitting, which is um, sashiko stitching, which is a form of Japanese embroidery uh, where they use much more sort of authentic and um, patterns in their designs. Um, in contrast, Kantha is more uh, plain and simple but beautiful as well. I'm just going to thread that in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do your stitches but hide your knots away. Now let me just show you, go back to my scarf that I made. I did something different here. Can you see, you can actually see the knot here. I think the sun's gone in, so I'm just going to turn the light up a little bit. And if I turn it over, you can see quite clearly what I've done. I've made those knots visible 
and part of the piece. So I've essentially made the knot and just started stitching and made no attempt to hide them at all. Um, so again, it's down to individual taste. Some people don't like this, their knots on show. Others are not so bothered. You could have longer tails on it as well. So it just becomes a feature of the work. But I will show you how to do some hidden stitches today. So I'm going to start by stitching about a centimeter in from my bound edge there. And I'm gonna put the needle in underneath the binding and I'm gonna bring it out just where I want to start making my stitches. I'm gonna pull it and as I'm pulling it, can you see the tail here? I'm gonna pull, pull, pull until the end of that tail drops inside so it's disappeared and then what I'm going to do is the tiniest of stitches just underneath that edging a tiny little stitch I'm going to pull it and can you see there's a loop here I put my needle in through the back of that loop and pull And as I pull it, that knot's hidden away and that's nice and secure in position. And now I'm going to start, at long last, the canther embroidery stitches or running stitches. So we start by going down through all three layers of the fabric. So the needle comes out of the back. And then go from the back to the front. I have actually put a little faint line down there as a guide. Okay, so that's how you do a running stitch. So you go down to the back. Pull it through and then you go from the back to the front, pull it through. Now that technique is great if you're beginning stitching and you want to understand the technology of stitches. But a much quicker way of doing it is to actually go down and out. So I'm, as I'm, it's come right through to the back and I'm using my finger to push it back upwards. Like that. So I'm doing the stitches. Almost like two stitches in one go. So I'm going to the back and the front in one, one sort of manoeuvre. Or if you've got a big nice sashiko needle like this, you could do several all at once. So as I'm going along, because I've made a row of stitches here, what I can do is start to release those tacks that we put in. So I'm just going to do a little knot at one end. And what I can do now, because we've got a row of stitches and that's in place, we can start undoing all of those tacks as we go along. I'm just undoing all those little tacks. I wouldn't do all of them, just, just as you get to them, you can start undoing them. So I'm just going to get to the end here and I'm going to show you how to finish off with an invisible knot. Okay. So I'm at the end here. And what I'm going to do is push my needle to the back of the work. And you can see the running stitches here at the back. So 
I'm just going to make another stitch but I'm not going to go through all three layers I'm just going to go through that bottom layer and I'm going to go back see where that thread came out there I'm just push the needle through and gone to that exit point at the same position and then do that one more time And again, I'm going to pull it so it's a little bit puckered, snip it, but then that tail will then drop inside the work. So that's how you do the Sashiko style running stitch. So you carry on going along your work using your, your chalk marks as your guide. I do them about half a centimetre apart. You could do them close together, you could do them further apart. Like here, you could change colours as well. So you've got different coloured stitching or you could use the same colour throughout. So that's basically the sashi. Sorry, I'm in Japanese mode, aren't I? <laughs> that is the canther style of stitching. So this little piece here could be used as a placemat. It's a little bit small, but you could also use it to put your hot pans on as well in your kitchen. Or you could turn it over. This is what I'm going to do with it when I've finished it. I'm going to stitch it from there to there and then use that as a little pencil case for my daughter. She wants a pencil case, um, but you could also put your knitting needles in it. Um, you could use it as a makeup bag. You could use it for a variety of things. So that's one thing that we could make with that. Oh, something really lovely happened by accident this week so while I was preparing for this workshop I had a dye pot in my garden with oat galls and iron in so I got a bit of this bedding the sheeting popped it in the dye pot and then overnight we had a big freeze and the next morning my cloth was frozen it's solid inside the the pan so I had to leave it for a few days but I managed to retrieve it yesterday and when I got it out it had this beautiful pattern on it and I think it's where the ice crystals attach themselves to the cloth and the dye couldn't get into it but it's actually turned out better than I thought it would. I was just after a grey piece of cloth. So what I did was I've cut four pieces 11 by 11 and last night I did some canthus stitches on it and made, let me get my cup, a little coaster for my cup. My husband's uh, claimed this already as his own, he loves it. And what I've done, I've not done any edging on it at all. It's just four layers. I've left that frayed edge because I really like it. Um, and that's made a beautiful sort of coaster. The other thing I've got here, someone mentioned a waistcoat. This is a project that my daughter sent me a few weeks back. And it's going to take me a long time to do this, but I've... Um, this is a, a Japanese style coat that we've designed. It's absolutely huge. It goes all the way over her shoulders, down the front and down the back. And I've done here, I've done sort of a variation on the theme of Canther. So you can see I've done like a circular style stitch here. We've put in some favorite bits of fabric that she likes. We've got in here one of her, a bit of clothing from when she was a baby. So a couple of pieces of baby clothing. This is a piece of fabric from when I was a baby. So we've put things that have meaning and memory into this piece. We've also put in a blank piece there and we're gonna stitch some words on it. So this is gonna take a very long time to do, but I spent probably two days tacking this all into position. So you can see all the orange tacking stitches there and uh, lots and lots of different bits of fabric that I've collected over the years from dresses and shirts, things that have meaning to us. So that's something you could do. And we've just made this shape up ourselves. On the back, you can see here, we have a bit of bed sheeting. So you can make a fairly big project with that. You could also make quilt covers. Um, traditionally, the women who made the camphor uh, style cloth were, were used them to make massive big quilt covers quilts as well that were handed down from generation to generation